Okay, in 9.3, uh, we're going to begin what is going to be kind of a collection of tests that will determine if an infinite series converges or diverges. So it's kind of important to point out that starting here in 9.3 and ending in 9.7, it's just going to be really a collection again of tests that we're going to use on infinite series to determine if they converge or diverge. So kind of look at 9.3 to 9.7 as one kind of big section, so to speak, where we're kind of breaking up um, all these tests into separate uh, sections, uh, just so that we're not doing it all in one lesson. So I think if you take that point of view, you'll kind of see that um, really each of these lessons from 9.3 to 9.7 is just a certain test we're going to use on an infinite series to again do what really the point of this uh, first half of this chapter is, and that is to determine if an infinite series converges or diverges. Okay, so here in 9.3, uh, we're going to talk about um, a test that's going to, again, determine whether uh, infinite series converges or diverges, and that test here is going to be called the integral test. And the reason it's going to be called the integral test, as we hopefully all know about this word integral, especially if it's a definite integral, is that has the uh, associated concept of area. Um, with it. So can we express maybe a series as an area? Well, for this kind of discussion here, before we get to the specific examples, um, in general, we have this infinite series here. Uh, we don't know exactly what the uh, general term of this is, but we have some sort of infinite series here, and we know two things about this infinite series. We know that a sub n is positive. The general term of this infinite series is positive, and we know that a1 is bigger than a2, is bigger than a3, is bigger than a4, which really means that the terms um, are decreasing. So we know those two things and just those two things. Um, our uh, terms are positive and they are decreasing. So just as an example, if we were to graph something that would fit that description, it might look something like that. And what we want to do is suppose this. We want to suppose that there's a function f of x that passes through all these points. Remember, and in uh, the sequence that we have here, uh, we can't really connect these dots. Um, it's not really a function that we can graph. It's a discrete graph, if you uh, remember that term. Um, so we really can't connect these dots. So what we're supposing is that there is a function, though, that goes through those dots. And of course, that function would be the exact same thing as that general term. But that has to be the assumption that we're making. Of course, we can find the area under that function. We know how to do that with uh, integration. So here's uh, kind of where we're going to go from here. Uh, the area under the curve is found by uh, evaluating the improper integral from 1 to infinity of this function. And of course, it doesn't have to start at 1. This is just kind of my general example that I'm using here, since n is starting at 1. Um, but that's kind of the idea here. Um, we can find the area under the curve by evaluating the improper integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx. If you want to make a note of this, we talked about these improper integrals back in the last section of chapter 8, um, if you need that little review. Okay, so uh, all of this stuff right here was just kind of the setup for what the integral test is. So what have we kind of already determined? Well, if we're going to use this thing called the integral test, we have to have terms that are positive, as you saw over here. We have to have terms that are decreasing, which we see right here and in the picture as well. And here's kind of the big one. The way you know, or I suppose the uh, idea for you using this integral test is do you have a function that's integrable? Of course, we would not want to use this test if we have some sort of function we can't take the integral of. That's why we're going to have other tests in later sections. So assuming we can say all those uh, three conditions are met, we can apply this integral test. So of course, there's two outcomes here. If we're going to find the area from 1 to infinity of using this improper integral, then of course, there are two answers we can get. What if we get an infinity as an answer? Or in other words, what if we find that that improper integral diverges? Well, luckily, as a uh, logical conclusion, if that improper integral is equal to infinity, which means the integral diverges, then that means the associated infinite series also diverges. 
So I think that kind of makes a little bit of logical sense. And again, keep in mind, this function we're integrating is the same thing as the general term of our infinite series. And again, that thing, whatever function that is, has to be integrable. You have to be able to find the integral of it, or this test kind of uh, isn't very useful. Okay, so what happens, of course, if our infinite or our improper integral converges? In other words, if we take this improper integral and evaluate it, and we get some sort of number, c is just a constant. It could be 10, it could be 1.5, it could be anything. If we get some sort of number for our improper integral, we know that the associated uh, infinite series converges. And again, keep in mind, this function that we're integrating assuming we can integrate it, is the same thing as that general term for our infinite series. So not really too hard to kind of understand in a sense. It kind of makes logical sense that if the improper integral converges, well, the infinite series must also converge. But here's the big thing you really need to take note of because I would definitely call this uh, a common mistake in terms of a conceptual common mistake. And it's uh, this right here. Just because we found a value doesn't necessarily mean that our infinite series is equal to that value. This integral test is just going to tell us if our infinite series converges or diverges. We don't know if it actually converges to this value of c that we're getting. And that's kind of a big, big deal in terms of what we understand about infinite series. Uh, we kind of know enough about certain infinite series only just to say whether they converge or diverge. We don't necessarily know what they actually converge to if they do converge. So a very important aspect uh, to this integral test. Okay, so let's apply this integral test to examples uh, that we've actually already seen before, and you might want to make note of this as we do both of these. The first thing I want to point out about this particular infinite series, though, is this is a very special infinite series that we're going to all have to know. Uh, it's going to be very useful once we start seeing more advanced uh, stuff later on in this uh, chapter. Uh, this series right here is called a harmonic series. Don't necessarily get uh, wrapped up in the reason why it's called harmonic. Just realize that this is a harmonic series because of its form of being 1 over n to the first power. And that's the key. It can be 1 over n squared, 1 over n cubed, or even 1 over n to the 1 half. It's got to be just 1 over n. Okay, that's kind of like a little side issue right now. Uh, we want to apply the integral test to this infinite series to see what uh, is going on. So two things have to be true before we apply the integral test. Are the terms positive here? Well, if you imagine plugging in 1 and then 2 and then 3 and then 4, of course, all of those would be positive numbers. And then, of course, if we listed out those uh, terms, we'd have um, a decreasing set of terms. Uh, so luckily, it fits the bill. And then I guess the most important uh, condition that needs to be met is can you actually integrate that function? Well, of course we can. We know that the integral of 1 over n is associated to the function of 1 over x, which we can do. So here's where uh, basically you can just kind of refer back to 8.6. We did this problem back in 8.6 uh, identical, not even kind of the same. It was literally uh, the same exact example uh, back from, I believe, the first slide of 8.6. So I'm going to kind of skip over those details, but just kind of realize to set up an improper, I'm sorry, to set up a proper integral, we need to take the improper integral and write it as a limit. So again, look back at 8.6 if you need that reminder. But ultimately, once you evaluate the integral and then take the limit, we're going to end up with infinity. So what does this integral test tell us? Well, we know again that this general term and that this function kind of are related in terms of this final answer that we're getting. Whatever this improper integral does, the uh, infinite series kind of also takes on that answer as well. So we just, we just discovered that this improper integral diverges, which means that the associated, um, the associated infinite series also diverges. So not a big deal, um, again, especially if you remember all of 8.6, which is all this calculus work here. Okay, so uh, let's look at another example. And again, this example 
once we get to the uh, improper integral part of it, uh, we did back in 8.6. This is not a harmonic series. Um, this has a, actually another name, uh, but we'll talk about that in the last slide of this uh, lesson. Uh, but for now, if we're going to use the integral test, uh, we have to first determine are our terms positive and decreasing. And again, it's uh, very easy to see here. Of course, the terms are positive when you plug in your n values. And of course, since we're squaring something in the bottom of a fraction, uh, these overall fractions will get smaller and smaller as we kind of list those terms out. So. If both of those are true and we can take the integral of our general term, then we should use the um, integral test. And again, remember, this uh, improper integral we're setting up is just the associated function for our infinite series. So if it's 1 over n squared, then of course the function we're going to integrate is just 1 over x squared. And again, we're doing this with an improper integral. And if you need the review of how we did this, um, or maybe a more detailed uh, breakdown of the steps here, I did this problem, I believe, in the second slide of 8.6. Uh, identical, just identical to it. So um, again, the key to doing these improper integrals is setting them up as a proper integral, which means you have to write it as a limit. Uh, other than kind of that reminder, uh, I'll kind of let you guys uh, review these steps here of doing this improper integral, but ultimately we'll find that this improper integral converges because we got a constant. So what can we say about the associated infinite series? Well, luckily we can also say that that infinite series converges. But here's the key, and this is what was at the bottom of that first slide that's ever important. We don't know what this infinite series is equal to. It is not equal to 1. All this uh, integral test will tell us is if the infinite series converges or diverges. And here we found it converges, which is great, but it's not equal to 1. All we can say is that it converges. Please make a note of this. I don't want to kind of confuse uh, anyone here, but just as a little bit of a, a side note here, uh, if you're curious what this is equal to, uh, it turned out that Euler, uh, if you remember Euler's method uh, back from chapter 6, uh, that mathematician proved that this particular infinite series is actually equal to pi squared over 6, which is about 1.645. So you can kind of see, I haven't really proven to you why it's equal to this, but you can see that it's definitely not equal to 1. Uh, those two uh, are not equal to each other. Uh, but just kind of note that's a little bit of a side note there. Uh, you don't really need to know that. Um, I just really want to uh, stress here that uh, just because you find a value for the improper integral, which means the infinite series converges, it doesn't mean that the infinite series is equal to that number. So very important idea. Okay, so you'll notice that these two infinite series really don't differ much. One is just 1 over n, 1 is 1 over n squared, 1 diverged, 1 converged. So what kind of is dictating why 1 is converging and 1 is uh, diverging? Well, it's kind of something that might make sense if you think of it in a certain manner. Um, and I'm going to call it the speed of a series. How fast are the terms of our series shrinking? You'll notice in our 1 over n series, uh, the first one would be 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, and that's shrinking, but it's not shrinking as fast as 1 over n squared. That would be 1 over 1 squared, and then 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared, 1 over 4 squared. Uh, that's getting much smaller, much faster. So that's kind of um, something that'll kind of uh, help you understand these series in terms of why some converge and why some uh, diverge. In 1 over n, the terms are approaching 0 slowly, so it ended up diverging. In the 1 over n squared case, the terms are approaching 0 much quicker, so it turned out that that infinite series converged. Um, so again, just a little bit of a extra concept to kind of build upon this uh, integral test and why some infinite series converge and why some diverge. Okay, so let's test this uh, infinite series for convergence or divergence. Uh, this is kind of the first true proper example we're going to do. Not that those last two didn't uh, really count, but those were very basic examples. Um, let's kind of do a true integral test on this infinite series here. And the first thing I need to point out is this. I would always start these integral, um, sorry, um, I would always start these infinite series off by using the nth term test. 
theoretically, at some point in this uh, chapter, um, we're not going to be doing the section 9.3 problems or the section 9.4 problems or what have you. You're just going to have an inter um, sorry, an infinite series put in front of you, and you're going to kind of need to know what test to use on it. I would always start off every infinite series by applying the nth term test. Um, the reason I say that is because it's a real quick test to use. And just recall from 9.2, if you get something other than zero, we know that it diverges. And then we don't have to worry about any other tests. So to kind of um, always put that on display for you so you can make sure that maybe this might be helper, helpful for you when you try these uh, tests, uh, what we're going to do here first is try the nth term test from 9.2. So if we take the limit of this infinite series, we'll end up with infinity over infinity. Not a big deal, we can apply L'Hopital's rule. In the top, we'll get a derivative of 1. In the bottom, remember the derivative of an e is itself. And the reason we have a 2n in the front is because of the chain rule. We have to take the derivative of the power, and that derivative of n squared would be 2n. But bottom line is, if you can handle that integral, it turns out here we'll end up with 1 over infinity when we, when we plug in infinity, which is 0. So unfortunately, uh, our nth term test does not apply. Um, we need to try another test, and we only have one other test available to us right now, and that's of course this new integral test. So can we apply the integral test here? Well, we have to first verify that our terms are positive. Here it's easy to see when you plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and on and on. We'll always get positive terms. And then if you think about this uh, terms we're getting uh, as we plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, of course, uh, these will be decreasing terms. Um, so assuming those two are true, uh, we can now attempt to use this integral test. So how do we set up this integral test? Well, we need to set up an improper integral that's associated to the general term of this infinite series. So luckily, that's not a big issue. We're just going to change the n's to x's. And then our, inter uh, our bounds on the integral are actually just going to be what you see for our infinite series, 1 to infinity. Uh, once we set this up, this is really just an 8.6 problem. Um, and we could have easily done a problem like this back in 8.6. So just kind of realize that. Um, once we kind of uh, get that set up, we're really just doing a chapter 8.6 kind of problem, which really comes down to can we integrate uh, the function here. So the first thing we have to do is again set up this proper integral. We have to get rid of that bound of infinity and replace it with what I usually call the letter b. And then because of that, we want to take the limit as b goes to infinity. So remember there's a bit of an order of operations going on here. We need to do the integral part first and then we can take the limit. So how do we take this integral? Well, you'll notice what I did is I sent that e to the x squared from the bottom to the top as a negative x squared. The reason I did that is because you can realize um, that since we can't integrate e to the stuff power, um, we need to call that u since it's not a plain x. So if we call that u, we'll get negative 2x dx. And of course, you can see there is no negative 2 in our problem over here. So we can go ahead and move that uh, negative 2 over to the other side and make it a negative half. Of course, wherever we see an x dx, we're going to replace that with a negative 1 half du. And then that power on the e will just become u. I'm going to put some brackets here just so we can kind of see that we're doing all of this right here, and then we'll take the limit. Uh, so luckily, this integral is nice and easy. If we take the integral of e to the u, it's itself. So we have a negative 1 half. That negative 1 half will just stay in the front. And then we'll have uh, e uh, to the negative x squared. We'll have to put this bar. And then we'll apply our bounds using the fundamental theorem of calculus. If we plug in the top bound, we'll end up with negative b squared. If we plug in the bottom bound, we'll end up with negative 1. So it'll be e to the negative b squared minus e to the negative 1. OK, once we have that, we're done with the calculus portion of the integrating, uh, concerning the integrating, I should say. Now we can take the limit. So all we need to do is plug in infinity for the b, and then just kind of figure out what that value would be equal to. And there's only one b in our expression here. So what is e to the negative infinity? Well, if you recall, again, back from chapter 5, e to the negative infinity is really 0. 
and then the rest of this we can kind of just clean up a little bit. We're taking a negative times a negative, so that'll be positive, and it'll be one half e to the negative one power. Okay, so that was a lot of steps. Definitely not an easy improper integral to do, uh, but now we're kind of done with uh, the old stuff, so to speak. Let's kind of now focus on the chapter nine stuff with this uh, infinite series. Now that we found this to be the answer, we see that our improper integral converges. So what conclusion can we draw um, using this integral test about our infinite series? Well, we can also say that our infinite series also converges, but be very careful. We don't know if the, inter if the uh, infinite series is equal to this. That's why I didn't really box that as an answer. Um, I don't really like boxing that as an answer because that's not really the answer. All we're doing is we're taking that result and making the, I guess, um, logical conclusion, so to speak, that if that uh, improper integral converges, then the infinite series also converges. So what I circled in red here is really what the final answer is. And again, just kind of take note here with this little reminder, just because we got this value of 1 half e to the negative 1 doesn't mean that the infinite series is equal to that. All that means is that the infinite series also converges because of the integral test. Okay, this integral test then leads us now to what is uh, one of the two most important series we're going to look at. Back in 9.2, uh, we saw what a geometric series was. So that was a very important type of series. This is the second type of series that is vital that you kind of know about. And that is called a P-series. A P-series has this form right here, where we have some number over n to a power. And of course, P is just some number. And we actually already saw that uh, in the second slide uh, that we looked at. So what's the difference between a P-series and a geometric series? And again, these are the two most basic series that are going to help us um, in a lot of ways. So we really need to know the difference between these two. So what does a P-series look like? Well, a P-series has an exponent that remains fixed in the bottom. In other words, um, maybe it be 1 over n to the third power, or maybe 1 over n to the fifth power. Ultimately, that power stays fixed. And what we're doing is we're plugging in numbers into the n. So in this case, we have 1 over 1 to the p, plus 1 over 2 to the p, plus 1 over 3 to the p. That's the idea when we're dealing with a p series. It has that form. So that's definitely a form that we're all going to have to be familiar with. Back from 9.2, as a reminder, a geometric series is a little bit different. The base remains fixed in this case. We have some number a times some number to the n power. And again, n is the thing you're kind of changing from term to term to term because we're plugging in a 1 and then a 2 and then a 3. So when we're dealing with a geometric series, the base remains fixed. In other words, we would have a uh, times r to the first, and then we'd still have a times r, but then that would be a 2 power, a times r to a third power. So that base is the thing that remains fixed. So it's very important that you know the two differences between these two forms. So let's kind of uh, go back to something we saw earlier in the second slide, that 1 over n uh, infinite series, which we called a harmonic series. Now that you know that there's, this is the form of a p-series, well, this harmonic series is just a special case of a p-series. Uh, 1 over n, again, being called this harmonic series, is really just a special case of a p-series where p is equal to 1. And we already know what happens in this case because we proved it. We know that when p is equal to 1 for a p-series, which again is called a harmonic series, we know that that p-series diverges. And the reason I'm putting this here, that we proved it using the integral test, is that's again an important concept to know, especially when we're going to be dealing with some uh, AP questions. Um, you could run into a problem where knowing that you have to prove um, this with the integral test uh, could be important to solving that kind of a problem. So uh, just be aware that if we're trying to prove if a p-series converges or diverges, that's done with the integral test. Okay, so how can we kind of generalize this uh, to just um, all p-series and not just this particular uh, one called a harmonic series? Well, of course, uh, there's going to be two cases here. What if p is bigger than 1? And what if p is less than or equal to 1? 
Well, if p is bigger than 1, then we say that that infinite series converges. And kind of the proof of that was in that second slide when we uh, looked at 1 over n squared and applied the integral test to it. And then after that, we kind of talked about the speed of a series. 1 over n was kind of approaching 0 a little too slow, so it turned out that it diverged. 1 over n squared, just going up one more power, did approach 0 fast enough, so then we saw that it converged. So of course, anything that's bigger than uh, 1 will converge. 1 over n cubed, 1 over n to the fourth, uh, and on and on and on. Um, so again, if p is bigger than 1, we know our p series converges. If p is less than 1, we already know what happens when it's equal to 1, because that's a harmonic series, but when it's less than or equal to 1, we know that this uh, p series diverges. And as a, an example of this, uh, what if we had 1 over the square root of n? Well, of course, in that case, I didn't write it this way, but we could, of course, rewrite that as 1 over n to the 1 half power, which is less than 1. If p is less than 1 or equal to 1, which would be a harmonic series, we know that that p series will diverge. So as long as you can kind of remember these two things uh, to figure out uh, what's going on with the p-series, we don't ever really have to apply the integral test again to these p-series. We just need to know these two cases, and then whenever we see it, we can say whether the p-series converges or diverges. In other cases, we might have to use an integral test because that would be the only thing to do if we didn't have an actual p-series.